Back at it again with the Mobius Dickus, chapter 18, His Mark. As a brief overview for this chapter, uh, we seem to encounter the notion here of what happens when true belief, which we discussed in chapter 17, conflicts with a certain course of action. And in this chapter, that course of action is hiring Queequeg. And I think Melville is making a particular point about the different approaches one might have towards uh, their true belief through the contrast of Bildad and Peleg, which we saw in uh, in chapter 16, Bildad and Peleg often represent different or contrasting views, and I don't think that's different here. So, at the start of the chapter, when Ishmael tries to get Queequeg onto uh, the Pequod, Bildad asks Queequeg whether he is a Christian, and uh, Ishmael first says, yes, he's a Christian. He belongs to the first congregational church. And then, of course, Bildad questions him further. And we get to this passage where Bildad and Peleg are starting to catch on to the notion that Queequeg is not actually a member of the first congregational church. Do tell now, cried Bildad, is this Philistine, uh, you know, a, a word that refers to an ancient enemy of the Israelites, but generally just means like pagan, a, a regular member of Deacon Deuteronomy's meeting. I never saw him going there, and I pass it every Lord's Day. I don't know anything about Deacon Deuteronomy or his meeting, said I. All I know is that Queequeg here is a born member of the first congregational church. He is a deacon himself, Queequeg is. Young man, said Bildad sternly, thou art skylarking with me. Explain thyself, thou young Hittite. What church dost thee mean? Answer me. Finding myself thus hard pushed, I replied, I mean, sir, the same ancient Catholic church to which you and I, and Captain Peleg there, and Queequeg here, and all of us, and every mother's son and soul of us belong, the great and everlasting first congregation of this worshipping world. We all belong to that. Only some of us cherish some queer crotchets, no way touching the grand belief in that we all join hands. Okay, so the use of the word Catholic here does not actually imply a Roman Catholic church. It means universal. And so what Queequeg is saying is that we all worship something, so can't we just get along, right? Does it really matter what we worship as long as we are part of the worshiping world? So Ishmael here is trying to find a compromise. Queequeg is not a true believer. Uh, he's a nice guy, and according to Ishmael, that's all that should matter. So this seems to me to be trying to find some moderate position between the true belief which we encountered in the last chapter, which is impenetrable from the outside, and having no belief at all. It says, well, can't we compromise? Can't we find something in common, even if we have true beliefs when Captain Bildad about Christianity, which contrast with Queequeg's true belief in his own pagan religion, right? How can we deal with that? Well, Ishmael seems to imply that the best way to deal with that is to find something that... Uh, <coughs> puts you into commonality with the other person. In the second passage I have highlighted here, we see that this argument from Ishmael is uh, rather convincing for Captain Peleg. As Captain Peleg says, Young man, you better ship for a missionary instead of a foremast hand. I never heard a better sermon. Deacon Deuteronomy, why, Father Mapple himself couldn't beat it, and he's reckoned something. Come aboard, come aboard, never mind about the papers. I say, tell Quahog there. What's that you call him? Tell Quahog to step along. By the great anchor, what a harpoon he's got there. Looks like good stuff, that, and he handles it about right. I say, Quahog, or whatever your name is, did you ever stand in the head of a whaleboat? Did you ever strike a fish? So, Peleg is convinced of this moderate path, right? This establishes him as someone willing to compromise on his beliefs in the face of practical concern, right? Well, even if I am a Christian, it doesn't matter that much. What matters is what uh, Queequeg is capable of. Now, I do notice that he calls him Quahog. I'll address that in a second. But first, let's just establish the evidence that Queequeg proves his practical worth with his extremely good harpooning, as it says that he darted the iron right over old Bildad's broad brim, clean across the ship's decks, and struck the glistening tar spot out of sight. So Queequeg has established himself not as a true believer who can become part of Bildad's value system, but he's established himself as having some separate value or importance outside of that system. 
And Peleg continues to play his role as the person who is open to moderation. When he says, quick, Bill, Dad, said Peleg, his partner, who had gasped at the close vicinity of the flying harpoon, had retreated towards the cabin gangway. Quick, I say you, you, Bill, Dad, and get the ship's papers. We must have Hedgehog here. I mean, Quahog, in one of our boats. Look ye, Quahog, I'll give ye the 90th lay. And that's more than ever was given a harpooner yet out of Nantucket. So this passage seems to reinforce... Uh, the second orange passage, where Peleg cares far more about the practical implications of what Queequeg can do rather than his thoughts or his beliefs or his identity, uh, hence the messing up of his pagan name into two very American or European words, Quahog, which is a type of New England clam. Those of you who are familiar with Family Guy will also note that uh, they're from the town of Quahog, Rhode Island, and Hedgehog, which is a Western European and American animal. So for Peleg, one's ability or practical skill comes before one's uh, belief systems or, or relationship to ideas. However, of course, this is going to be contrasted with Bildad, for whom the relationship is the opposite. And then he and Peleg will have to have this debate. Because even though Creekwig has demonstrated his skill and demonstrated a pragmatic reason to overlook his uh, not being a part of the worldview of Bildad, Bildad still says, Son of darkness, I must do my duty by thee. I am part owner of this ship and feel concern for all the souls of all of its crew. If thou still clingest to thy pagan ways, which I sadly fear, I beseech thee, remain not for I a Belial bondsman, Belial being a synonym of the devil. Spurn the idle bell, that was probably an editorial change, it should have been B-E-L. And the hideous dragon, the dragon is an image which comes in the book of Revelation to represent the devil, Turn from the wrath to come, mind thy eye, I say. O oh, goodness gracious, steer clear of the fiery pit. So Bildad is the type of true believer who will not be moved by arguments and importance outside of his belief system. He doesn't care that Co Queequeg is a good harpooner. Instead, he sees him and he understands him solely through the lens of his true and strong belief, which should remind you of the ending of chapter 17. Of course, this is contrasted again with... Peleg's admonition that caring too much about your own personal attitude or views on something is actually counterproductive when he says, Nat Swain, once the bravest boat header out of all Nantucket in the vineyard, he joined the meeting and he never came to good. He got so frightened about his plaguey soul that he shrinked and sheared away from whales for fear of afterclaps in case he got stove and went to Davy Jones. So, Apparently, Nat Swain is the example of someone who, unfortunately, according to Peleg, inverts his value hierarchies uh, and goes from caring more about the practical than the theoretical to suddenly caring more about the theoretical than the practical. And to Peleg, this is a tragedy, right? He stops catching whales in favor of this, you know, kind of uh, obsession with the theoretical or with the religious or with the ideological would probably be the best term here. Now... Bildad doesn't necessarily buy that. Bildad says that caring more about the ideological is probably a natural thing for people to do. Thus, he makes the argument personal and brings it to Peleg and says, Thou Beliest thine own heart, Peleg. Of course, this is a pun, Beliest uh, on Belial. As you can see, Belial uh, is right next to the verb belie, which is to fail to give a true notion of something, right? So, you belie thine own heart, Peleg. Tell me when this same Pequod here had her three masts overboard in that typhoon on Japan, that same voyage when thou went mate with Captain Ahab, didst thou not think of death in the judgment then? So what Bildad is saying is, look, when push comes to shove, right? When push comes to shove, don't you care more about what will happen to your soul? Don't you care more about ideological concerns than the practical world? Don't you care more about theory and religion when pushed to the brink than you care about, I don't know, how much money you can make or, you know, just physical stuff, practical concerns? But Peleg keeps his position strong. He says, hear him, hear him now, cried Peleg, marching across the cabin and thrusting his hands far down into his pockets. Hear him, all of you, think of that. When every moment we thought the ship would sink, death and the judgment then? What? With all three masts making such an everlasting thundering against the side, and every sea breaking over us fore and aft, think of death and the judgment then? No, no time to think about death then. Life was what Captain Ahab and I was thinking of, and how to save all hands, how to rig jury masts, how to get into the nearest port. That's what I was thinking of. 
So note Peleg's return to the language of the practical, rigging jury mass, saving hands, get to the nearest port. So here, Bildad and Peleg are explicitly contrasted, and Peleg seems to walk away from the chapter victorious, once again demonstrating through the Japan example that his true belief ultimately gets subsumed by practical implication, that his ideology is mendable or bendable or shiftable. It's not rigid. And thus the chapter ends with Bildad taking his L and not talking anymore. And I find this image very interesting. It says, there he stood very quietly overlooking some sailmakers who were mending a topsail in the waist. Now and then he stooped to pick up a patch or save an end of tarred twine, which otherwise might have been wasted. So Bildad spends his time picking up what are essentially scraps and waste. So I think the easy way to read this chapter is to say that Bildad ends the, ends the passage picking up these scraps which seem to mock his obsession with ideology or belief as spending time on equivalently worthless, worthless things as scraps of little rope or scraps of little patches of paper um, that perhaps people who care too much about people's internal beliefs and too little about their actions are missing the point that Christ would care far more about what type of person you are than what you theoretically believe in your head. As long as your actions are good and you love your neighbor, what's the big deal? As long as you can metaphorically uh, throw your harpoon well, what does it matter what your ideology is? What does it matter if you're a Republican or a Democrat or a Christian or a Hindu or you know you like pineapple on pizza or you don't? So to me, the chapter is about the pragmatic necessity of tolerance. And it uses Bildad as the obstinate true believer who refuses to engage in dialogue versus Peleg the Compromiser, who I think is painted rather positively here and in the face of practical concerns can bend or shift his belief. Uh, and I think that, again, as I've stated, this is explored through religion in this chapter, but applies to many other ideologies beyond religion. Okay, chapter 18 in the books. See you in chapter 19.